that we are trying to put uh, working. It's to try to 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 do uh, more with less. Um, we have uh, the finance of, of the, the urban the urbanization in Lisbon. It's uh, in Portugal. We have taxes, national taxes on the property. We have taxi, taxes on the real estate uh, trans, uh, transition or transactions. We have municipal taxes, as in the main part of the countries, and uh, the private uh, promoters are obliged to give to the municipalities the spaces, the areas to the equipment. Uh, so we decide in, to have a new master plan that has been approved, approved August uh, last year uh, with a new paradigm. It's to reuse what is void. It's uh, why we show uh, LC factory and other situations where we have a lot of buildings that are void. You have enormous spaces, by instance, by uh, military installations that uh, are void, hospitals that uh, uh, are, are going to be deactivated to, to build a new hospital by economical uh, reasons. And so we have a lot of space in the city that we can reuse. And so our priority is to reuse, to rehabilitate what is in, in, as a show, and to regenerate the areas uh, that need to be regenerated. And this scheme, it's not easy to read, but there are three main goals. More people, more jobs, and a better city. And that means that if we want to have more people, we need to maintain people that is living in Lisbon, but we need to attract new people, mainly young people. We need to have affordable housing. We need to have the equipment to uh, people, uh, to new families to stay there. If we want to have more uh, jobs, we need to have space to enterprises. You need to utilize what we can utilize to use physically. And there are, we make a kind of uh, decomposition of these goals to, uh, to have uh, different politics and to know exactly how to act in the administration. So how can we mobilize uh, investment? And it's there, the, the, we have a, a, a system of incentives that uh, uh, if someone uh, develops something that is in accordance with the main goal that we have established, we give a premium. We give an extra capacity of construction. We give what we call it a credit of construction. So the credit, it's not reported with the land. It can be moved, it can be sold, it can be transferred to other uh, areas of the city. And there are two kinds of, of uh, credits. To compensate the loss of opportunities, by instance, to restore heritage, where by the alignment of the buildings can increase the height or to build a new building, as it is an element of the, of the heritage, uh, architectural heritage, we don't allow to do it, but we compensate by the difference of construction. The dif difference of right of construction can be transferred or can be sold. If, by instance, we have a free green space that we want to integrate in the public, uh, as a public space, we give a credit or to motivate behavior, uh, uh, behavior, for instance, rehabilitation building. If I'm the owner of a, a, a building that needs to be rehabilitated, I gain credit that I can sell uh, in the market. Or uh, affording housing, or to release, uh, uh, to recuperate areas inside neighborhood blocks, 
or to introduce bioclimatic concepts or supply car parking for residents. It's a, a rule to calculate the, the credits. It's, uh, it deals with, uh, with uh, the points that we attribute by uh, evaluation of each uh, project. It depends on the location. We have uh, established that there are locations where we want to, 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 to they are priority, they have priority in the development, so they, are, they have a, a, a bigger uh, credit than other ones. And so, with this, we establish a rule, it's very transparent and very clear. And at the same time, we fix where we can transfer the credit. So all the blue areas that generate credits, all the red areas can absorb the credits. But uh, we fix the, 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 the difference, we fix a medium uh, capacity, and then there are an increase of roughly 70% that can be uh, uh, filled with the credit that uh, uh, someone buy on the market, or, or he can generate if introduced by instance affordable housing in his development. Some roughly examples, by instance, that's an intervention that has been done some years ago in Lisbon. Now, what's happened is that the, this difference can be sold as a credit. And By instance, another building, it's not it's, uh, an important heritage. It's not a, mo a national heritage monument. It's a local heritage monument. But also, if uh, the owner will uh, develop and make the restoration of this building, he can gain uh, credits that he can use in other situations. Or, by instance, a area, private in area, the city, and if part of the green area will become public, you have credits that you can use in other areas. Or, uh, use of the, the, the inside of a block that is occupied by a house, and if he demolished the warehouse and he have a more uh, uh, green area inside the city, he can also have uh, credits that he can sell. In conclusion, it's a system that uh, uh, we have a very good and very modern uh, legislation, urban legislation. We have one instrument that I don't know if you have here on the States, it's the, what we call equalization. It means that uh, if there are, uh, we make an intervention with di di different uh, own, uh, uh, land owners with different uh, properties, with different areas, we fix a medium uh, density and we can, we can distribute by all the property, uh, uh, all the owners the, the capacity of construction. And of course, we can use, if there are one part of the land that it's near the underground station, we can have a valuation bigger than, uh, than the other. We can do the, what we call <coughs> interpolation to put all the land together and subdivide. Uh, and there are, uh, they are uh, included in our law. The very, very modern law that allowed us to work. But what we need now is to, to block this system of transfer credits in order to obtain to, uh, the goals that we have fixed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tito, I hope you are listening. Tito, last night at the table we had a discussion just along these lines, how zoning could be used to advance public policy rather than stop public policy that you always have to look at it and figure out, you know, we are in the midst of a revolution. Our revolution, hopefully, is a different type of revolution, <laughs> but we are in the midst of a revolution, how people are living, how they're working, and how they're demanding amenities. And in some respects, the zoning hasn't kept pace with that revolution. So uh, we had a very spirited discussion last night. Thank you. Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Well, that was very impressive. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we can see it. Uh, 
We've been very fortunate to have a vice mayor who is a professional in urban planning and architecture, uh, uh, and that's very helpful. I'm, I'm just going to, uh, I, I love all this stuff. I, I understand you can get in the weeds very quickly, and I don't want to do that. So I want to talk just a very high level about uh, planning and zoning, uh, comparing the Massachusetts perspective. At one level, what are the goals of what we're trying to do, and then what are some of the tools uh, about how to get there? Uh, and in the goals, I think one thing that was noticeable about what you did in addition to the particulars of the program, the fact that you were able to say what those three big goals of your planning and zoning were. And that, I think that's a fundamental challenge for us in Massachusetts. I have said for many years that if you invited, I don't know what the right professional would be, some kind of cultural anthropologist to um, not to talk to anybody, just to be handed all of our planning and zoning laws in Massachusetts and to say, from reading that, what is the, in, what is the purpose of our laws? Um, and I think that anyone reading the rules would have to say that the purpose of the laws is to make it difficult or impossible for anything to happen here in Massachusetts. Um, that's the, and I would defy anybody to come up with any, there's, there's no other way to look at our rules it doesn't, it's, you're not trying to get anywhere. It doesn't explain why we're doing this. It's just to make everything. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. So, um, I've made a good living at it. <laughs> uh, so I think, so then you have to say, well, how is that happening and why is that, uh, why is that happening? And, and uh, you know, so the truth is, here's what the governor and I have tried to do. When you look at that, uh, it, it seems, like, that can't be the purpose. You know, what, why is that happening and it's unintentional? But I think in some ways we have to acknowledge that for Massachusetts, it's actually pretty intentional. Um, and there's some legitimate reasons for that. Massachusetts, I don't know, you may not know this, is the third most densely populated state in the country. There's always a, already a lot of us here. Um, and we are, I think, universally seen uh, as being a state that has managed, despite that density of population, to have an extraordinarily high quality of life across our community. So in some sense, I think we, uh, as a citizenry, are saying, hey, you know, this is pretty good. We like it like this. We're already pretty built up. Let's be very, very careful about growing anymore. And I think, actually, you saw this even in the last couple uh, weeks uh, when the governor has been talking about uh, his new proposals. He's saying, well, we need additional revenue in order to make investments. We need new investments in order to grow. But then if you listen to him, he kept going and he said, we need to keep growing to create opportunity, create opportunity in every part of the state and to create opportunity for a next generation. And I think the reason he had to go to that fourth link in the logical chain is that in other places you could say, well, we need revenue to invest, we need investment to grow, and people would say, okay, that's right. But here you'd say, well, wait a minute, we, no, we said we don't really want to grow or or we're, we're deeply ambivalent about that. So you, you, you got to explain to us, Governor, why do we want to grow again? We're not, we're not sure about that. So that's what, so what we've tried to do is to, is to, is to add the fact that um, what we, we do need the growth. Uh, we do need uh, the economic opportunity. We need to spread it around the state. And that even though we are a uh, densely developed state, we still have plenty of room to grow. Our, our major city, Boston, used to have 800,000 people in it. And now it has 600,000 people in it. And so we have uh, the idea that, well, we, we've reached this maximum capacity and we ought to stop uh, is not right. And we're seeing, obviously, everybody in the audience would know we're seeing the same challenges that Lisbon has seen of, uh, we'd like to see more revitalization of the urban core, but instead we're seeing the growth moving out. So what we're saying is let's not, uh, let's try, what would it look like to move in Massachusetts from a model where we're saying, uh, growth is bad or we have to be very nervous about growth and to be uh, and to say well let's actually talk about hopefully in a public process participatory way there are better kinds of growth and there are kinds of growth that clearly do have ne negative impacts um, on our quality of life and on our communities um, but that we shouldn't throw out growth as an idea we it's we're desperately important as a state for us to continue to grow so let's talk amongst us what does good growth look like so I think that's at the first level, that's my reaction to what you said. For us, uh, it, would be, uh, it would be amazing if we could, someone could look at our planning and zoning laws and say we have three so, uh, public policy principles that we're trying to push forward here. We don't, uh, we, we're not conveying that message now about where are we trying to go. And then the other, as you go down to the tools, 
Uh, I, uh, so we're trying to get that message across. What does good growth look like? Let's talk about that, where it, where it should be, what kinds of growth, um, a mix of uses, uh, uh, making sure that we're not excluding low and mid, uh, moderate income people uh, from the opportunity to live in these places. And then when you get down to the tools, uh, we, we are pushing in the same way um, to have more emphasis on the incentives and the rewards and less uh, on the uh, regulatory tools or, or punitive tools as, as you uh, describe them. And again, if your worldview is growth is bad, then you would come up with a lot of heavy regulatory and punitive rules. You would stop that. Uh, but if, if in our model, if we're saying, no, there's some kinds of growth that are good and even necessary to have uh, a vital urban communities, uh, then just telling people what they can't do uh, is not enough. You have to uh, say for these there's certain kinds of growth that we do want to encourage and we have to be positive. So we have uh, in Massachusetts now, as some of you know, some very, very uh, limited incentive type tools. We don't really use transferred development rights. We do in some cases have density bonuses uh, that we do uh, allow for to encourage sort of behavior. But you mentioned actually there were two sort of categories of the way that the uh, rights were used. One was to compensate for the loss of opportunity, and the other was to motivate, motivate behavior. I would have to say most of our density bonuses are more in that first category, to compensate for the loss of opportunity. So if you see a local zoning code that does provide some additional density, it's actually it's not creating a situation in general where there's financial reward to doing it. It's, it's, it's sort of mitigating or offsetting some requirements that have been made so that there's less of a financial downside consequence uh, to meeting those other regulations. So we were, uh, so that's something I think is a great lesson um, from Lisbon that we ought to look more at. Uh, we have tended in Massachusetts and the United States not to provide the rewards through our zoning and permitting. In 10, we've, we've, tried, we've uh, instead provided some uh, financial incentives. So we have lots of tax credits. Massachusetts um, still consider those financial tools, but first look at whether there's an easier and actually a cheaper way uh, for a city in the to encourage them to growth, which is just to make it very Secretary indicated, we are a very densely populated state with separate jurisdictions. Every town has their own set of rules. Every city has their own set of rules. And what you find is that in a, you know, when I heard last night, which was encouraging that the communities of the city of Boston and Cambridge working together, but one set of rules could be here and it doesn't, it doesn't mirror with something that's less than a mile away. And there's no coordination and, and Commonwealth in terms of um, uh, concerted growth options and, and uh, discussion as to what makes sense for the region, which is a very hard political issue in this state because we are a very we call it home rule where every every uh, jurisdiction is is unto itself. So we're, we're trying to work through some of those issues that I think uh, was, was discussed last night. That while Boston and Cambridge may provide the office and the um, research and development space, maybe it is Lowell, or maybe it's some other place that provides housing and they work together to, to achieve that. So we are making pro progress, but there's a lot of long ways to go and new ideas. I think it was Eleanor Roosevelt, one of the first ladies of one of our presidents, said, do so think a thought every year, do something every day that scares you. And we try to, at least in my office, we try to think of things that change and, and hopefully uh, contribute to the Commonwealth and the growth of the opportunity. So it opened up to questions.
So in part of my past life, I worked for community development corporations in uh, Jamaica Plain and in Dorchester. And uh, one of the issues that's discussed here is keeping talented people in the city, making uh, cities livable, which gets to affordable housing. And so what I would say as a general rule, there is no affordable housing for low-income people without subsidy. There just, it, it isn't. If we had a totally free market, the city of Boston would have less and less affordable housing every year. And so what some of the obstructionism of the zoning code has actually been a means to extract public benefit from developers for scarce re resources. So in return for giving access to scarce resources of city land, the city of Boston has forced affordable housing or other community benefits from them. <coughs> so we can say that the zoning code, even though it prevents things, it does have a purpose. It's a tool. And Otherwise, we're going to end up pushing uh, affordable housing to mining areas outside the city because of the value of our land. And so I'm not pushing any position, but I do think that the zoning rules that we have, which are obstructions, have a purpose. It's an obscure purpose, but it, in some ways it's a public benefit. So if we're going to change that and we're going to make it easier to develop and we're going to modernize our city, how at the same time do we find the subsidy mechanisms to keep that young family and that beginning worker or that service worker who's necessary for our biotech labs or our researchers? How do we keep them in the city and how do we tackle that problem um, instead of sort of just beating up on the zoning code? So that's, that's my Concerned. I actually don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think that if you look at zoning and fine tune it to achieve those objectives, but I, I would venture to say that no one ever goes back at, at any coordinated basis and looks at it in a totality and says, how is this working? Is this program working to create affordable housing? Um, you know, my, my complaint, having done a lot of 40B work over the years, is that the media and the Residents fight 40 Bs, which is affordable housing for those in the audience who don't know it. But once they're built and thriving, no one ever goes back and reports how well they're doing. You know what? You, the Boston Globe doesn't go back and say, look at this great project. I don't know if people remember Columbia Point years ago in the 60s and 70s. And there was a rethinking of that model. So people have to step back sometimes and, and assess, is it working? And if it is, let's let's foster, use the zoning code or, or other policies to push what is working and not focus on what isn't working because you'll find that as you develop, a, a developer says, I'm just throwing money after something that doesn't work so I can get my permit to do what I want to do. You know, this type of coordinated, dynamic document. Let's assess how well we're doing. I just say in the Boston case, I think uh, actually it's an interesting that's sort of uh, an exception to the rule, I think, that in the affordable housing, um, it, it would, what, what's been done in Boston with respect to affordable housing inclusion, I think, would, would meet both of my tests. Because first of all, uh, there is a clear goal. There's a policy, and the goal is to make sure that there's affordable units included, uh, and everybody understands why we're doing it. Uh, and secondly, as a tool, it actually is a, is a pretty predictable rule. Now, you'll meet developers in Boston who grumble about it, but it doesn't slow you down. Uh, it's consistently enforced. You may, not, uh, you may think it hurts your bottom line in your building, but you, go, you know that the guy down the street in Boston who's building a, an apartment building, he's subject to the same rule. It's been very consistently applied, uh, and so uh, people have incorporated that into their budgets, and, and that works pretty well. I think that if you look at other issues, for example, like height, then that's a place where in Boston, I'll give you a, a, a zoning map of Boston with the permitted height, 
and then you know, I'll, you know, we'll have a wager on whether the next building in that district is built is that high or twice as high. And um, you know, it, w it would be a coin toss as to how that works out. So that, that's a place that's been a very, uh, there are other parts of the zoning code where that's, and, and, and in particular, uh, so I think we've done a better job of articulating affordable housing, green space protection, and other things. But on what I consider this core issue of growth, again, if I gave you a zoning map of the city and said, what does it tell you? What is Boston saying about where it wants to grow? I think you'd have a hard time telling me from the zoning what what direction the city, where the city what message the city is sending us, what, where it wants to go. And I think if you look at the vice mayor's chart that he had early that he said this is very confusing, it may be confusing, but it appears to me that's well thought out what their objectives are. And what that allows you to do is have measurables. Are you meeting those objectives? Yes, I would like also to explain that uh, when we have been elected in August 2007, the first thing we decide is to make a, a strategical discussion. And uh, in two years or one year, we produce a document. We call it a strategic charter and uh, uh, where we fix some goals to, to the city. And the most important goal is to say we need something that can continue, uh, have continuity and not interrupt by the political cycle. And uh, with this chart, we, we designed the new master plan. And so uh, we have an idea exactly what we want, what are the goals, and the question is, to find the, the, the tools to arrive to, to those goals. We have an enormous difficulty, uh, or <laughs> very enormous difficulty. The first one is uh, 2007, it's uh, uh, so, some months before uh, the Lemon Brothers uh, failure. And so it's <laughs> It's the crisis, and the, 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 in Europe, the crisis is terrible. So uh, what we, we do now, it's planning with growth zero. Uh, we need to use what we have. It's why it is so important to, to reuse buildings existing and to give new uses to those buildings and to those spaces, and to have a better quality using what we have. Uh, to have more people, to us it's uh, essential, it's a question of sustainability of the city. It's a question of financial sustainability, of economical sustainability, of social sustainability. It's why it's so important, the new economy, and to try to... Yeah, and it's why it's so important to work with universities. And uh, uh, we are always or giving land to universities or creating conditions to develop the internationalization of the, uh, the Lisbon University. So that's our goals that are absolutely fundamental to us. Um, we have an advantage. We have land. Because in the, during the fascism, uh, a half of the city has been expropriated. And so we still have land that we can use to uh, to how do you say how do you say this eleven car like this to uh, to increase and to to allow business to produce affordable housing. It's not social housing. Social housing is one thing. What you want it's housing that can be uh, put on the market in the reasonable uh, cost, but not what's happened now where we have even the taxes, the property taxes uh, in Lisbon are three times higher than in the periphery. And so uh, we, we have the opportunity to use our land to promote housing to fix young families but we need to have schools, kindergartens, and all the equipment to have families in Lisbon. Thank you, Robert Beal. And a couple of thoughts. One, Boston is very much like Lisbon. We represent 20% of the population, 
of the metropolitan area. And the fact that uh, Leland with uh, City Councilor Mike Ross brought Cambridge and Boston together to start working together is important. And what also keeps coming back to many of us is that Greater Boston is the university and hospital capital of the world. We have almost 300,000 students coming into Greater Boston every year, and the basic issue is how do we create housing that they can afford to live in and stay in Boston, and one of the other elements that a number of us have been talking about is how do we outreach to companies in Boston, whether it be financial, life science, and on and on, to keep our graduate students to remain in Boston and not leave Boston. And I think this is something very important that we need to think about. Thank you. Um, I wanted to thank the secretary for talking a little bit about uh, keeping Massachusetts on the cutting edge. I spent some time in um, Indiana living there and you know you see what became the Rust Belt and when a community kind of gets left behind when their heavy manufacturing and what they've relied on leaves uh, what can become of a community. So I guess my question is um, when you don't know what's next, when you don't know what the next industry is, how do you keep uh, yourself in terms of the zoning laws on the books, how do you keep that fresh and versatile so that you're able to adapt um, when there's a shift in the patterns of, of the way people live and where they live um, and the type of business that gets done in the Commonwealth, how do you keep that fresh and, and versatile so that um, we can take advantage of, of you know, the industry that's coming 10, 15 years down the line? So I, uh, I think the Communities that have done a better job with it uh, have just thought about their zoning codes in a way that anticipates and addresses that point, and they and they don't try to be overly prescriptive. That they are created. Their image is not we're sort of laying out our community for, as it will be for the next century, uh, as people probably did a century ago, thinking of this is the, the and we had some of the first uh, master planned entire cities in Massachusetts, some of our, you know, mill towns in, in uh, Lawrence and Lowell and Holyoke and so forth. Uh, and so I think the, the first step is just to, that your point is incorporated into people's thinking that there is uh, flexibility. And actually Bob is working, I think, on an interesting example in um, uh, Marlboro right now where you had a, uh, that in its way was another generation of pretty cookie cutter thinking, which is that all along 495 we were going to have a series of Standalone business parks that were going to be lo strategically located near exits off 495. They were going to be single-use properties. Um, you know, there wasn't a lot of control over the architecture necessarily, but the mental image was these buildings are all going to look pretty much four-story corporate. always been an awareness that there's change and you have to think about um, uh, the uh, revitalization. But I think what's interesting in Massachusetts right now is we're seeing some of our suburban communities um, that are also saying, okay, we've got to um, change it up and be more flexible. And right now in particular, um, allowing a mix of uses as opposed to different zoning districts, residential, commercial. Yeah, I will say that in my practice, what I try to do is it's really education. It's trying to educate these communities that a rigid template doesn't work anymore. We don't put all the industry by the river or the rail line and whatever. And, and one of the things that has really hurt a lot of development is it's, it's very cumbersome that you can get three quarters of the way there and realize that the zoning bylaw or the, the city ordinance doesn't permit you to do that last step to make a real noteworthy or, or premier project. And what I've tried to do, and, and municipalities have been receptive, is to build some real flexibility into the zoning such that rather than start over or go to another board or another regulatory process, 
to empower the, the permit granting authority, be it the city council, the planning board, whatever, with broader powers that if in this instance the ability to waive a requirement or to rethink the, the template makes sense with certain parameters, they can make that happen. So that allows you to look at a project that, you know, be a telecommunications that 20 years ago we didn't know we would have, or some other industry that has come alive that when the zoning was written it wasn't thought about as being a viable uh, opportunity, that they can react uh, quickly. Um, it's less of a problem in a city because a city with zoning can meet and, re and react in a, in a much more expeditious manner, but in some of these communities you may have a town meeting that requires a two-thirds vote and they meet once or twice a year. Well, that, that's, that's problematic if someone wants to locate and develop there. And, and no matter what we want to think, we're not the smartest people in the world. We can't think of every possible contingency. So try to build the flexibility. And, and then what happens is you have to deliver. You have to alleviate the fear that by creating flexibility, you're not creating problems that can't be solved, that you're actually solving problems. And that's the test. You have to deliver. I would say just one more thing to your to your point, I think I would consider it a good measure of a good of a town's good planning and zoning if uh, that someone who came in with what you and I would just consider uh, a creative, innovative proposal for using the property, that it was as easy to get your permits for that as for the sort of same old predictable thing. And right now, that's a challenge. It goes back to your point about motivating good behavior. So in a lot of our communities, actually. Uh, it stifles the creativity because you might want to do something, in, the private sector might want to do something innovative, um, but then their lawyers tell them, well, uh, yeah, it, but it's going to take you four years to get your approvals for that if you did, if you know, if you went back to the plain vanilla to get you your permits in six months, and that's, that's not rewarding the behavior we want to be rewarding. One of the things that I see, and, and you may see it in, in uh, Lisbon, is Decisions aren't made locally anymore. I mean, if you're trying to court a Google or a major company, they may be making that decision in a, co in a conference room a thousand miles away, and they're making that decision by looking at what is objective. They look at your zone, they'll find an attorney or whatever to review the zoning bylaws or the city or Can we do that? If you don't have that flexibility in there or the creativity in it, the decision is we don't even want to talk to that community because they don't have the they don't have the rules in place to allow that to happen. So you don't even make the short list. And you know what? You'll never know it. it used to be that someone would knock on the city manager's door and say, we'd like to locate here. And we, we understand what it takes to locate here, be it housing or infrastructure, whatever. But we've read it all. We understand it. We could work with the city. But if you don't have that in your operating documentation and it's being reviewed and Southern California or Northern California, you don't make the short list. They never come and, and knock on your door. I'd like to make only a small comment. Um, the first thing, we are the downtown of the Great Lisbon. The municipality is the downtown. So when we did the, the new master plan, we finished with the zoning. We don't have zoning. We have consolidated areas and non-consolidated areas. And we have the areas around the, um, the underground stations where we can have a more density and the residential areas uh, where it, we have a lower density. And we admit always the mixed uses, but we have certain percentages between housing and uh, uh, service and commerce. And there are always a reference of the, qu of the quality of the residents. It means that there are a compatibility that depends on the effects that the activity can have under the housing. It means if there are noise, if there are too many traffic, and so it's only the criterion. And the other aspect, um, it's not very orthodox, but the only one that can say a project, no, it's myself. <laughs> How difficult is it to set up an office in Lisbon? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to do our second to last question. I am going to reserve the last one for myself. Wow. Uh, good
Good morning, uh, Patrick Bench. Uh, I've been following the discussion, and uh, and what I think is really interesting that I'm hearing about is uh, the opportunities where I'm I'm see, uh, you know whether it's through Mass Challenge or you know what's happening in Kendall Square and, and Innovation District in Boston. There's a real focus in terms of first-time entrepreneurs that are 25, 26 with their first company, and they're playing into they know Boston and they know Cambridge really well, but they don't really have a good understanding of Massachusetts as a whole. And so I, it goes to a point which which I thought was really interesting was um, they didn't have the good knowledge of the strengths in say Worcester, or Lawrence, or Springfield. And the reason I bring it up is, you know, the comment that's sometimes made, and I think the state's done a great job to uh, counteract it, is we're great at research and development, we're great at commercialization, but there's some points where we really compete with the North Carolinas and Ohio's and other ones that will come in with site selection. And one of the thoughts I had was, is how do we best engage these entrepreneurs early in the process with, you know, gateway cities opportunities so they have a good knowledge of everything that's invited them in the state and kind of educate them with zoning. Um, and one thought may be, uh, as, as these companies grow, you know, they have a good understanding of, of what's happening in all the gateway cities, because I think that's what's going to be really exciting, especially all these companies that can operate in the cloud. You can do video game companies in, uh, in Worcester, as well as the you know, mobile apps companies in Lowell and Lawrence that are right up the road from Cambridge, same workforce. I think sometimes they have, you can just see Boston and Cambridge, there's so much to offer there, you might kind of lose sight of everything else that's in the state. So uh, I guess my question is, is, is how can we better educate about how to, how to zone in the gateway cities for these companies that are looking to expand across the state? So, well, again, I think you've got to start with a set of, of, are we all on the same page about where we're trying to go? And I think you know, that's why the importance of the work that uh, Leland and, and Tito are doing. You, you have to, uh, it seems to me, it's just unarguably true that a prosperous Cambridge is good for Boston, a prosperous Boston is good for Cambridge. So, it, it, at any, it, there's, yeah, there's a little competition there, but in the big picture, that's true. And so, we have to extend that pad across the state and say that um, a prosperous Massachusetts is good for the communities. And so, uh, right now, we don't, I think we don't really have a way of, um, in your example, of a startup company that is growing to a point where it doesn't make it sense for it to be in Cambridge anymore. We just we kind of just don't have the, the, the social glue right now that if uh, someone, if it's going to Springfield or if it's going to North Carolina, well, it's, you know, it's, it's leaving Greater Boston, so we lost it either way. And I think part of it is we have to say no, that it's, uh, it sh it's not just in Springfield's interest to be talking about how, as a company moves to prototype and manufacturing, that they should stay in Massachusetts, but that's actually in Boston and Cambridge interest as well. In other words, that the more our companies stay here when they grow to scale, um, even if they do leave the urban core, uh, or a big chunk of the business leaves the urban core, if we can keep it in Massachusetts, that's, that's really a win for everybody. Uh, so I think that's the that's uh, for a starter, and we are um, that's part of it. And the other part of it is that we just have to do a better job of um, branding and marketing what those opportunities are, and starting uh, to make those connections. We're doing them now in very limited ways. But for example, we're talking to to you know Tim Rowe that the companies at the uh, Cambridge Innovation Center that are making physical products and they need prototyping and so forth. Uh, are, are they using uh, manufacturers uh, in Massachusetts to help with that prototyping work and so forth and, and making those connections? I was at another um, uh, e-commerce uh, startup in uh, Cambridge uh, two days ago, and uh, they are growing to a point now that they actually need a call center, and they were predictably thinking about putting that call center in you know, North Carolina. Um, and we're actually going to talk now about whether it makes more sense to put that out in Western Mass. But interestingly, in that case, one of the co-founders was from, was from Northampton, which is in Western Mass, and he still said, oh, yeah, that's right, you know, we could think about that. We never thought about <laughs> okay, okay. Um, So it's an ongoing process, but um, I think that's, that's absolutely, it starts with a message that uh, keeping the business in Massachusetts is, is great, and, and it helps everybody.
One of the traditions of the, the Chatham Forum is um, once we know who's coming, we look at a, a small group, gathering a small group for breakfast uh, on Saturday morning. And this morning, it, to focus on a subject that's not covered in the agenda. I started off that breakfast discussion this morning saying, um, I'm always looking for action items. So Mr. Secretary, one of the things you've said this morning that really struck me um, was your comment about how our zoning laws and regulations um, do not have that clear purpose. My question is, what are the action items we can be taking to correct that situation? Well, so what we're, um, uh, I think the most important thing that we've been trying to do is actually, it's, it's more of a planning issue than a zoning issue. And I think as you mentioned, that was the Lisbon approach as well, which I like very much. Uh, and what we started, uh, what we started doing, and we've actually started doing this with a lot of communities outside of Boston, uh, is to say that the question are, you know, are, I, and I started actually are asking communities, having conversation about, are you a pro-growth community, which turns out to be uh, almost, a, it's a, such a difficult question to get your arms around and people don't want to say one way or the other. So I learned to say, can you tell us about um, neighborhoods or districts in your community where you think new growth would be good and important? Exactly. And to just start with that, um, and that's something that we started with uh, in southeastern Mass. We took um, the 37 communities that would be affected by the South Coast Rail and said, uh, if the South Coast Rail would enable new d growth down here, where would we like to see it happen? And then we repeated that in um, the 495 Metro West area. So I think that's something that I would, I think would be a great thing for us to work on is in our in, in the urban core in Boston uh, and Cambridge. You, you mentioned how much city land there is in Lisbon. There's a lot of city land in, in Boston as well. But can we um, could we can we come up with a consensus in our urban core in Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, Chelsea, uh, Revere? Where are the places where we can really develop a consensus that more growth? Um, would be in the would strengthen the community and would be good, and then start then start talking about how we bring the tools. If we're agreeing that the goal is growth, then how do we bring the tools together? I think I hear the opportunity for you to lead an unconference session in there. <laughs> um, well, I want to thank all of our panelists and, and moderators this morning. As you no doubt notice, there has been a pr problem with the projector, and as you can also see, it's not so easily accept accessible to fix. Um, so uh, the Chatham Bars Inn is going to be making copies of all the presentations, um, which we'll be handing out to you later, so you have um, access to those. Um, as we transition into this last phase of the, the uh, Chatham Forum, uh, the unconference phase, um, I wanted to pay particular tribute to a, a, a group of individuals since last year who um, have met at least monthly to advance what started as five projects and were eventually consolidated into three um, and have put in countless hours, uh, tremendous amount of energy and effort to see these ideas through to fruition and continuing to keep them going. Um, there were about 15 members of the uncommittee, and I just wanted to take a moment, although not all of them could be here with us this year, uh, to, to thank them for all their hard work. As I mentioned last night, the three projects that came out of uh, the unconference last year were eventually boiled down into the Freshman at Fenway uh, project, uh, which continues to, to be developed, although it is I can tell you a massive undertaking, and it's taking a bit longer than we had originally hoped. Um, the second one was Innovation Week, which I mentioned also last night, and I want to pay particular attention and share thanks with uh, Helena Fruccio, um, who really spearheaded this effort and put in a tremendous amount of work to make this um, idea a reality. So Helena, thank you so much. The third uh, uh, project was AwesomeBoston.org, and 
this is a, a well, I'm not going to tell you what it is just yet, but I think one of the competitive advantages that we have in the Boston area, um, and I think is kind of at that heart for anybody who heard Mark Zuckerberg um, talk about how if he had to do it all over again, he would have stayed in Boston. I think what he was really getting at there is that it may be easier to access capital in California than in Boston, but what you get in California is a check. In Boston, you get an investment that goes so far beyond just dollars and cents. It includes mentorship and a community of support that you don't get everywhere else. And Awesome Boston uh, really is trying to capture that and to share the success stories of our region and our Commonwealth. So last night we had three very exciting announcements. For those who weren't able to join us, I'll just quickly recap to say that we, we announced that we'll be going to Dublin for this year's policy exchange mission. We announced that we'll, we're coordinating with the Prime Minister of Ireland uh, and Governor Patrick to not only meet with the Prime Minister while we're there, but to really begin the um, effort to forge a trade agreement, a cooperation agreement between Massachusetts and Ireland. And my, my favorite announcement of the evening was Councillors uh, Chung and Jackson announcing the second opportunity for Boston and Cambridge City Councils to come together this year around, or this time around the issue of talent and uh, building off of the foundation that the Talent Magnets Report of World Class Cities Partnership is about to release. Um, our final major announcement for the weekend is one year after the unconference. We are very happy to announce um, the launch, as of today, of AwesomeBoston.org. So though their schedules were not uh, able to permit them to be here, I really want to pay particular um, attention and thanks to two people, Debbie Kleinman and Pete Andrews, uh, who really deserve the bulk of the credit for putting together the AwesomeBoston.org website. They both wished they could have been here in person this weekend, but unfortunately had prior engagements. Um, so they were excited about this event and, and given that it was the birth of this idea and thought that it was only suitable that we officially launch the website today. So Debbie and Pete have made a short video for us to, to watch this morning. Welcome to Austin Boston. Boston. Just over a year ago, the concept for Awesome Boston emerged out of a discussion towards making Boston better, with an eye towards innovation and futuristic thinking. From this discussion, one theme perpetually resounded, that our innovation economy has a major PR problem. And from there, Awesome Boston was born. Our goal we need to be relentless about telling our own story, our story, the one we weave as a city and as a commonwealth together. Our story is unique, it's bold, it's rooted, and it's game-changing. We need to boast, brag, gloat, inspire, and be proud to showcase all of the inspiring dedication and opportunity that comes out of this great city. Dedication that yields such a great community. It's a story that we need to tell together. And AwesomeBoston.org is a place where we'll do that by collecting and aggregating the innovative stories that are happening in our own region on a daily basis. Second, Boston is an initiative that will strengthen a growing and opportunistic bond. We're excited to such an integral role to their successes after they graduated into their careers. So we need your help. Join the movement. Spread the word. Let's make Boston so much more awesome than it already is. Do you have an idea, have a story to share, know someone who'd be perfect to speak, or maybe you'd be interested in speaking to? Visit us at awesomeboston.org and let yourself be heard. So together, we can be relentless. So as you can probably tell, I'm really very proud of, of this website and the work that the entire UNCommittee as a whole has put into making these many projects possible. 
I think one of the things that makes this group, all of us assembled here today, so special in this weekend so unique is the action-oriented mindset that exists here. And I think that the unconference is the perfect format to capitalize on the energy and motivation that we all share. As many of you undoubtedly remember from last year, Joshua Kaufman led our very first unconference. Um, he is a globally active designer, a consultant and facilitator. He lectures and leads workshops in academic and corporate contexts and is a frequent facilitator of innovation gatherings and conferences such as this. We are very glad to have him back with us and I want to thank him publicly for flying all the way from Trinidad to continue to lead us in the way only Joshua can. With that, I'd like to point you to the back of the room. Josh is already waiting in our circle. Give your thoughts, develop ideas, and assign this afternoon's sessions. Please grab your belongings and take a seat in the circle. Please do not forget your passions, ideas, creativity, questions, thoughts, and your ideas at, at your table. Bring them with you. Trust me, you will definitely need them. Thank you so much.